everyone. Hi. How are we doing? Great. You're not doing great? <laughs> um, my name is Sharifa Wright. I work here at the college. I'm class of 2003. And I'm introducing our next speaker, Shadra LeBouvier, class of 2007. <clears throat> So last month, uh, Jean-Michel Basquiat's 1982 untitled depiction of a skull forged from oil stick and spray paint brought $110 million at auction to become the, most ex the sixth most expensive work ever sold. Yakuza Misawa, the founder of the Contemporary Art Foundation, who the previous year had set the record for a Basquiat acquisition, purchased a painting uh, for a planned museum in his hometown of Chiba, Japan. The New York Times, taking its cue from a longtime Basquiat collector, called the sale mind-blowing. And indeed, many people were surprised. Basquiat scholar, writer, and activist, Shadra Le Bouvier was not shocked. She has spent her career working to keep Basquiat front of mind in the popular consciousness. Before Misawa, and before the artist was name-checked by the lights of Jay-Z and Drake, Shadra has been proselytizing about the universal brilliance, genius, and unapologetic blackness of Basquiat. She began her Basquiat research during her sophomore year, year here at Williams, and has since gone on to massively impact um, the conversation about the artist. A graduate of the class of 2007, she's a contributing writer for L.com and Refinery29. <clears throat> And her work has been published in Harper's Bazaar, New York Magazine, Vice, Allure, and The Week. Her work mainly covers police brutality, culture, politics, beauty, fashion, and art. She was the first writer, I know, right? <laughs> Williams through and through, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> she was the first writer to directly address police brutality in mainstream women's magazines. Her writing for Elle, Influence, Vogue, and other peer magazines, subsequently provoking, contributing to the percolating conversation about representation and inclusion in the media. Shader has interviewed subjects such as the actress Amandla Stenberg, Eric Garner's daughter Erica Garner, 11-year-old literary activist Marley Dias, and as well as our recent commencement speaker and honorary degree recipient Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. She has also informally advised a number of companies on editorial inclusion and relevancy, such as Samsung, Cuidad, and Diva Curl. For Shadra, this work is deeply personal. In the midst of pursuing her MFA in screenwriting at UCLA, she lost her brother Clinton Allen to police brutality on March 10, 2013. Six months after her brother was murdered by Clark Stella of the Dallas Police Department, Shadria co-founded Mothers Against Brutality, a multiracial, multi-ethnic coalition uniting families nationwide to fight for civil rights, police accountability, and policy reform. Since then, she's become a leading voice in the Black Lives Matter anti-police brutality movement. So I work with a lot of alums. I love them all dearly. <laughs> Um, and we have a lot of incredible volunteers and donors that are really dedicated to the college. But the average alum, regardless of their profession, doesn't spend a lot of time thinking about the direct implications of their professional work for the community, and specifically the student community, that they've left behind in the Purple Valley. However, Shadra has made it her mission to ensure that her college, as we all know, um, a predominantly white and affluent community, far removed from the everyday lethal consequences of police brutality and anti-black racism, accounts for, interrogates, and works towards the dissolution of white supremacy. In January 2015, she and her mother, Colette Flanagan, delivered the Claiming Williams keynote. And this past November, Le Bouvier worked with the college to bring Basquiat's 1983 painting defacement, subject of this talk, to WICMA where it was the center of an exhibition and intellectual study, including the winter study that Shadra taught. 
Her work on defacement is an extension of her activism. The 1983 painting that depicts the graphic death of graffiti artist and model Michael Stewart at the hands of six New York Metro officers, Le, Bouvier work, Le Bouvier's work on defacement has become globally recognized as she leads groundbreaking scholarship on a painting which has largely escaped public attention. In, her recognition, in recognition of her writing in this arena, she was recently invited to participate in the prestigious Hermitage Retreat. This project with WICMA has already had an impact on art history's engagement with the Basquiat conversation, appropriately, as the home of the art history mafia. Um, we, you know, Shadrian Williams has consequently influenced how the Guggenheim, the Studio Museum, the Brooklyn Museum, and the Perez engages with the artist. When describing why Basquiat's project with WICMA was so important to her, Shadrian noted that unlike some, she was not in the immediate position to donate lofty sums or pieces of art to the institution. Arranging this loan and building an educational program in conjunction with the college around this piece, this was her gift to the college in her 10th reunion year. Shadrian is a gift to Williams College and her commitment to guiding the moral compass of our institution and our community is noteworthy and exemplary. Please join me in welcoming Shadra Labouvier. Good morning. Um, I'm a woman of many talents, but height is not one of them, <laughs> or gifts rather. Um, thank you so much for coming. I know that you all have had to travel a long time to get here. So um, thank you very much for making the time um, to be here this Friday morning. Um, so we'll talk about Basquiat's defacement um, and kind of the themes that uh, circulate, uh, circulate through this uh, painting, particularly trauma, majesty, and state violence. Um, so here is an image of the painting. Um, it's it's not as bright as I would like for it to be, but um, here's kind of a backstory. Um, this was painted, we think, um, in October or November of 1983, um, very shortly after Michael Stewart was killed uh, or died um, of his injuries um, sustained by a, a beating by the Metro, uh, the transit police um, at the First Avenue L station in New York City. Um, and, and so Michael Stewart died September 28th. Um, and so this was done between October, November of that time. I personally think that it's um, October because of the urgency and sort of the way that other uh, facts kind of calibrate around the painting. We know that it wasn't December of 2000, uh, December of 1983, um, because by that point he was already in LA working on another painting that is, re or print that is related to this, um, which is back of the neck, which we'll see uh, later. Um, so I really want to j quickly acknowledge people who have been so helpful um, and so much a part of this. Um, I'm very much the face of this research and this project, but um, it's very much a group effort and I could not have done it without very key people who have been um, invaluable for the last two years. And, and Sonic Coggins and Lisa Doran and Nina Pelez, who work at WICMA, have been absolute champions of this, of this um, project and of defacement. And they, we were all so enormously on the same court that um, Basquiat is an American master. Um, we did not need an auction to know that. And it's actually quite rare to have people in the museum world that understand that on a scholastic level and really put resources behind it to um, give him the attention that he deserves. Uh, Franklin Sermons, um, who's the director of the Perez Museum in Miami, has also been a tremendous champion of me and this work. Um, and he's also um, an amazing Basquiat scholar. And if you have any interest in Basquiat, I highly suggest and recommend that you delve into some of his work. Um, Nina Clemente and the Clemente, uh, Clemente family. Uh, Nina is the steward of this painting and was chosen by Keith Haring to be the steward of this painting when she was nine years old. And I'm always floored at how right Keith Haring got it to leave it, to have the foresight at 31 to know to leave it to the right nine-year-old. Um, 
And so, um, and, and the Clemente family who has, who've also given me their blessing um, in taking this painting out into the public. I'm enormously grateful. Um, the Stewart family, Michael Stewart's family, because of my own personal history with police brutality and loss, I know how important it is to make sure that the people who, um, that people aren't erased. And also, I think in art history, there's a habit of, uh, of muses and inspirations behind paintings being forgotten. And so it was very important that Michael Stewart be a part of this conversation and not be a dovetail um, only when Jean-Michel Basquiat is mentioned. Um, and Joseph A. Hutchinson, who is in London, um, I want to acknowledge him because he has been, was so enormously supportive of me in London. And um, I stayed with him when I was in London working on this research and putting it together. Um, and I cannot overestimate how important I think it was to be out of the country last year working on this. Um, and also my family, uh, which also includes Williams, I've had, um, so many people who've been so supportive from uh, my freshman frosh quad, best friend David Brown, who has always uh, been in my corner, even when we fight ferociously. And uh, Carl Clayton, who's also in the crowd, who um, his parents have uncomplainingly kept my car um, while I've been in LA and in New York and in London, um, back in New York. And so um, I want to acknowledge um, them very much so, thank you. Um, and I also want to acknowledge my own brother. Um, so often in my work, um, I have to put him on the back burner. Um, and that is never an easy decision to do. And I also think that it's important to acknowledge that he is a part of this community because he has impacted so much uh, conversation here and in the broader world. Um, it is no question for me that this Basquiat research would not exist um, had it had it not been for the fact that he did live. I would be doing I would still be doing Basquiat research, but not in this capacity more than likely. And so, and I think it's important to um, to acknowledge his contribution for me um, because. I'm often being a writer and my own story being so public, I often don't have the space to um, bring him out as much as I would like to. Um, I want to kind of start with an overview of Basquiat um, because I understand that maybe not everyone is as familiar with his work and his canon, um, which makes sense because we don't teach him at universities and colleges. Um, that's slowly beginning to change, but I know when I was a student here at Williams, my research on Basquiat became self-study because I was not able to take courses um, that focused on him or that incorporated him at all. Luckily, Williams had resources with interviews and books that were out of print before the YouTube era, so I was able to begin that work here. Um, but this is Horn Players. Um, it's a 1983 work, and um, it's from his early period, which is 1980, 1980, to, 1980 to 1983, or 1981, depending on how some people look at it. Um, and it's, uh, and that's pretty much, it's the strongest year, it's uh, his strongest period rather. He only was active for eight years. And uh, most of the paintings that you are seeing at auction that are commanding these tremendous prices, Lahara, Untitled, um, they're from this early period. And so Horn Players, I think, is one of his more accessible paintings. Um, it is a uh, painting that is about jazz. And here you have, is, where's the, there we go. Um, here you have, um, I think this is Charlie Parker, and then you have Dizzy Gillespie, and you have, um, oh no, this would be Charlie Parker because that's the saxophone, so that would be Dizzy Gillespie. Um, and so, so this is a pretty popular painting. You see it in, on social media a lot, um, and I think it's because it's um, less abstract than some of his other works. Um, this is the the um, this is another skull. Um, this is also another that is very popular. It was the cover of the exhibition catalog for the 2005 Brooklyn retrospective that um, Dr. Kelly Jones and Franklin Sermons um, curated, and I think has um, is one of the blueprints for um, for his work on on the uh, exhibition level and um and this is uh, very similar to the painting that just sold for auction um and they're about a year apart um anatomy was a tremendous interest of him of his and you see it uh, reoccur a lot in his work 
Um, this is Silver Car Crash, Double Disaster. This is not Basquiat, but this is Andy Warhol. Um, and Andy Warhol had the record for the most expensive American paint um, um, painting sold at auction before Basquiat um, broke his record um, la a couple of weeks ago. And I think that that's important to acknowledge because um, Andy Warhol, um, I should say that um, Basquiat and Andy Warhol had a very had a had a working relationship, had, had a friendship. But during Basquiat's life, and they've collaborated on a series of paintings for a show in 1985. But um, during his lifetime, and I think to in some art critics have um, particularly um, you know said that Basquiat w uh, benefited um, or, or needed. Andy Warhol in particular, or that Andy Warhol was the more talented of the group of the two, um, and that uh, Basquiat in the show that at the time um, when it was when it was um, the what was it the the show when it was uh, when it debuted was not well received. It's since been reclaimed by art history, but it was critically panned when it came out and. Um, and it actually broke up their friendship um, as the reviews and the undertones were quite racist. So I think it's particularly poignant that Basquiat, that the record that he broke was Andy Warhol's. Um, Notary is also another one that circulates um, pretty popularly. It's um, very characteristic of Basquiat and as you see, he uses every inch of the canvas. Um, and that's important to notice because defacement is so different. Um, it's defacement is a minimalist painting for him. Um, and this was in early 1983. Um, I'm not sure, maybe March, um, but this was before defacement. And this is the painting that is in the notorious Mark Miller uh, interview that is on YouTube if you choose to Google it. Um, this is also another uh, painting that is very, very strong and very popular, Undiscovered Genius of the Mississippi Delta. Um, and this is Riding with Death, which is probably, which is uh, his, a minimalist painting of his, my personal favorite, and is credited as his last painting. I believe it was completed in April of 1988. Um, so what makes defacement so special and so singular, and why is the art world so excited about this painting? Um, I'm definitely not the first um, to look at defacement or to incorporate it, but the project is by far the most thorough and the most extensive, um, and it's a project that's completely devoted to one painting, which is not unheard of, but it's, it's not it, it is quite rare. Um, and usually the paintings that get that kind of attention are paintings that are um, already included in the art history canon and are, and are by quote unquote recognized art history masters. So you have The Scream um, by Edward Munch, you have Water Lilies um, by Monet, you have uh, the Mademoiselle de Avignon deep of Picasso, you have the Mona Lisa um, by Da Vinci, um, you Starry Night by Van Gogh, and uh, Le Déjeuner sur le Herbe by Manet. So these are all paintings that are iconic on their own and have been the subject of individual uh, rigorous scholarship or exhibition particularly with the Mona Lisa, which came to the US on loan in 1963. Um, and as a side note, I was quite inspired by that model um, of Jackie Kennedy bringing the Mona Lisa to the US. I'm also not related to Jackie Kennedy. Um, I do get that question sometimes. <laughs> not related to her. Um, <laughs> But um, I loved the idea, I'm a, I was a history major and I'm a tremendous student of history and I loved the idea of taking one painting and really giving it uh, the scholarship and attention that it deserved and treating, as Franklin said, one painting like an exhibition. And so um, I really loved the model of what uh, Jackie Kennedy did with the Mona Lisa in 1963 at the National Portrait Gallery in DC and I thought it might be interesting to kind of play with that a bit. Um, and so, and also Da Vinci was a hero uh, and a competitor, so to speak, of Basquiat's, um, at least um, painters that he felt that he was uh, in competition with on a canonical level. 
Um, but what makes the effacement so special is th the composition is really so, so different. And as we've seen with the other paintings, Basquiat is a tremendous fan of horror vacui, which is just a very fancy word of saying he complete, he's a hoarder on the canvas. Um, and this is a minimalist work for him. Um, and also, um, and the colors are very different from his usual palette. And the reason why I say that they're more aligned with Keith, Keith Haring's colors is because of what we know about how it was created. Um, he went over to Keith Haring's um, studio on Broadway in Lafayette, which is now, I believe, a Hollister store. And, and um, he went and painted this painting uh, on the side of a wall. And so actually, it is drywall. It's cut out of a cut out drywall, and it's very fragile and very, very heavy. And so the collector actually uh, told me the story about how they had to move it to storage because it was literally tearing down the walls of the loft. Um, and, and also the, the, the frame, which you will see later, um, has its own tremendous backstory. Um, and it's a frame that Keith Haring chose and commissioned, and he had it modeled after the Ritz-Carlton in Paris, which is where he spent a lot of time. Um, but so I say that these colors are more aligned with Keith's just because they are probably Keith Haring's colors. Um, Basquiat, excuse me, did not, more than likely did not bring uh, paint paints over to Keith Haring's studio, and also pink, um, that color of blue, those are just not colors that you see a lot in Basquiat's work. Um, and in speaking with uh, people who've watched him work, particularly uh, the uh, a screen printer that he wore, a silk screen printer that he worked with in LA, um, Basquiat was not particularly um, passionate about the mixing of colors. He often used them straight out of the tube, um, but you know, it was very passionate, obviously, about the application and the thought and the conception, but um, color work in terms of mixing is not necessarily something that particularly interests him beyond what he bought at Pearl Paint and put on the canvas. Um, and also, it's hard to see, but this is, a kind, this is an orange, and then there's like a faint lot of um, uh, sea green. And then this is actually like a burgundy. Um, and those are Keith Haring's colors more than likely, probably run over or, or excess from the spray painting um, on the wall or painting as he often did with his work. Um, and that's important because it helps us to know, uh, once I have an opportunity to go into the Keith Haring archives, it helps to better place this painting in a time by being able to look at what Keith Haring was working on in 1983 at that time by looking at the colors. Um, and the, the use of black slash black as a racialized uh, uh, identification is hyper sophisticated and a play on color theory. One of the basic um, rules of painting that they, that is kind of taught in 101 is that you do not use black because of its vacuous effect on the canvas. It tends to draw all of the attention and, and leaves a, a kind of gaping hole. So often when you look at paint, uh, paintings, particularly uh, Im Impressionist onward, it's not um, actually black. It's a very, very dark brown or a very, very dark blue. Um, so, and, and I think that that's important to look at his use of color, particularly because the, um, the spin of him being self-taught is often used to discredit his genius and his um, cleverness in playing with the rules, or even the fact that he knows the rules. And so I think it's important. So, and I think here, I'm trying to find the, is it? Oh, there we go. Um, and he's kind of reaffirming right here that he knows that he's breaking the rules. So you have this black body, which symbolizes Michael Stewart, but you also have this uh, affirmation here of not only of the rule that he's breaking, but the black body. And I think that that is just a very simple, but very brilliant uh, double entendre in the painting. Um, and the multi-layered meanings and use of the copyright in De Um And so I think that that copyrights are a very, very popular, or very common and popular thing for Basquiat to use. Um, and it's in many of his works, starting with his graffiti work as Samo. And my theory on the use of the copyright is that, you know, the Copyright Office um, protects 
property. It protects rights. Um, and and given the um, and given the the two police on the side, and there's kind of a a, a a less, uh, I don't want to say a less identification, but it, it's kind of, it can be interchangeable, just like the black body could be interchangeable, the police could be interchangeable. And what I think he's communicating is that this violence is routine and that it's state sanctioned. And because of the lack of accountability, um, which is was nothing new in 1983, um, I believe that the copyright is also a commentary on the, the 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 state's assumed right to violate black bodies, um, and I also think that when you look at the history of defacement, um, he was very very distraught. Uh, Jean Michel um, frequently told friends, "It could have been me. It could have been me," and um, and of course the. Uh, the police during that time were found not guilty and not responsible. Um, and the Michael Stewart case was a tremendously important event in the 1980s. Um, I was not alive when Michael Stewart lived or died, but um, in the process of looking to see how that event has impacted the art world and culture of the 1980s, it's been quite stunning. Um, Basquiat was not the only artist to comment on Michael Stewart's death. Um, Michael Stewart was an artist um, in those circles and was friends with, um, or friends, friends or friends of Keith Haring, Kenny Scharf. Um, and so I think, and Kenny Scharf relayed to me, um, he was beaten uh, about a week before Michael Stewart was killed and in the same area, and he believes by the same police around the same time. And he said that the only reason why, that they, why they didn't kill me was because I was white. Um, and he also said in a conversation a couple of weeks ago that we had that um, he said that you know the only reason why the Michael Stewart case got out the way that it did was because Michael was a part of the art community in the East Village, and we all protested and we all organized, and it was the first time that we all came together, and it wasn't just this sort of, you know, hedonistic kind of live by the day. We came together politically for Michael Stewart, and so, and I think that that's really, really telling when you start looking at the posters and you start looking at the newspapers and the way in which artists, other artists, um, um, commented on it. Um, I also think that, um, or Andy Warhol also did commentary on this, and Spike Lee did commentary um, and do the right thing. The death scene of Radio Rahim is commentary and inspired by Michael Stewart's death. Um, and then also you have references to Emory Douglas's work, Picasso's Guernica, and Disasters of War. And again, even though this is a minimalist painting, he's packing a lot in. Um, so here are the side-by-side -side comparisons of some of Emory Douglas's work, who was a minister of culture for the Black Panther Party from 1967 until the early 80s, 81 or 82, when they officially, well, not officially, but kind of eventually disbanded. Um, and at the height of their circulation for the Black Panther, which was the Black Panther newspaper, they had a circulation of, I think, 139,000 um, um, per week, and um, they were in major cities. Um, it is not implausible to think that Basquiat, who was born in 1960, um, who would have been a teenager uh, in the 70s, um, it, particularly in the mid-70s, would not have seen the Black Panther newspaper. Um, and Emory Douglas is credited with creating the relationship between um, pigs, at, the police as pigs. And so that comes from the Black Panther, um, his work with the Black Panther Party and in the newspaper. Um, and so you see that relationship of the, of the pigs here and the pink symbolizing that, and also you know, the wolf uh, fangs, which also alludes to the violence, but also uh, cartoons, which were also um, inspirations of Basquiat. Um, this is Guernica, which uh, is an iconic painting, and I very much see Guernica um, in this painting in that Picasso was Basquiat's favorite painter, um, and Guernica uh, was his favorite painting, and he's gone, he 
has gone on record to say that. Um, also, to put into an historical context, in 1983, Guernica had only been returned to Spain for two years. Um, up until that point, it was at the MoMA in New York City, and many artists from that time um, talked about going to the MoMA and seeing it and it having this very imposing placement and positioning at the museum. Um, Mike Glear has also talked about his time in the late 70s going to see Guernica. Um, and, and I think that because uh, Basquiat, um, to, in his, for him, competed uh, very presciently with the masters of, of art history, um, I very much see defacement as, uh, as his own Guernica. And very much when we're talking about depictions of state violence, um, I see Guernica in that conversation as uh, Goya's Disasters of War, which we'll see in a minute. And Guernica, um, really, uh, that's where the conversation, um, in, a, in a modern sense, begins when we're looking at how artists depict and render state violence. Um, this is Guernica's Que uh, Mas Se Puede Hacer, and What More Can One Do? Um, and Goya created these plates. There's a series of 82. He created them between 10 years. Um, and it was um, commentary on the Peninsular War. Um, and what is very interesting about this is that Picasso was inspired by Goya's disasters of war in his own work, and particularly with Guernica. Um, and I don't see defacement so much as being similar to Goya's disasters of war so much as I see it in conversation. And I think what's particularly interesting is that Goya, um, like, like Basquiat, um, Goya did not intend for these to be seen uh, publicly, and these were not released until after his death, much like defacement. Um, so trauma, majesty, and Michael Stewart. Um, here's a picture of a young Mike, um, young Michael Stewart. The date is unknown by me, and that's only because I forgot to ask his sister. Um, and so I think it's important to say that because you don't know something doesn't mean that it's unknown. Um, <laughs> um, and, and it's very easy for what you don't know in your blind spots to be taken as fact, and they very quickly enter the canon. And, and so as, uh, as an activist and someone who, who believes in intellectual honesty, it's very important to make those distinctions. Um, and so I think it's important to have a picture of Michael Stewart because we are ultimately talking about his death. And um, also, these pictures have not been released in the public, if you Google, Michael Stewart, there's only one photo in the public um, domain, and, um, and I think it's important that we have a fuller picture of who he is and what he looks like. Um, this is not the best picture, but this is, uh, but there are two things going on here. This is an exact copy of buttons that Michael Stewart's family and friends passed out in 1983 to protest for, uh, for his justice. Um, and his family, um, they were very, very generous to uh, allow, to, to make copies to pass out to my students that I had during the winter study. Um, additionally, this is what Michael Stewart looked like when he was murdered. Um, and it's important to notice the difference between the fro that he has and the dreads because this picture and pictures of him with dreads are not circulating in the public. Um, and there are very complex reasons for why that is, um, but I also think it's important to, to think about some of the challenges that his family might have faced. 1983, a black man with dreads, and you're trying to rally public support and empathy, and I don't think that dreads in 1983 would have been would have elicited that same response. Um, so that's why pictures like this of him in a fro circulate more. Again, early 80s, you're coming off of the 70s. That is more um, familiar to people than dreads. Um, but it's important to say to notice that because he looks quite a lot like Basquiat at the time of his death, um, in so that they had the same hairstyle. Um, and, and I think it adds another layer to when Basquiat says, it could have been me. 
Um, that's what Michael Stewart looks like is erased from that conversation. But again, I think this is why it's important that in art history we really take in all facets and the research be 360 because by looking, by incorporating Michael Stewart and what he looks like, we have a fuller picture of what Basquiat meant when he said that. Um, and also Andy Warhol wrote um, in his diaries, um, and he was detailing how Keith Haring was so distraught about Michael Stewart's death, and he writes, uh, but this kid who was killed, he had the Jean-Michel look, dreadlocks. And that was September 29th, 1983. Um, September 29th is also, incidentally, my brother's birthday. Um, Back of the Neck is also a painting that I mentioned earlier. Um, Back of the Neck was created in December of 1983 in LA when he was working with a printer there um, during his silk screening process. And Back of the Neck is particularly interesting. Um, my research has um, connected it to defacement. It's not a painting that um, previously was recognized. I think it was mostly chalked up to uh, Basquiat's uh, obsession with anatomy, but it's much more than that. Um, if you look at the the cause of causes of death for Michael Stewart, and if you read the police reports uh, and the newspapers, um, the uh, oops, sorry, the aspects of anatomy that Michael Stewart, that Jean Michel is looking at, are. Um, at, correlate with Michael Stewart's injuries. So Michael Stewart is put into a chokehold, and we see the arm at a 90 degree angle that would fit into a chokehold. Um, braccio is Italian for arm. Uh, thank you for reminding me, Jordana. And uh, spine, he had tremendous spinal injuries. Um, and he's very explicit about that. And again, you see that copyright. And I see that again as this relationship and trademark with state violence. And when you think about defacement being done October 1983 and this being done in December of 1983, it's very easy to see how he's continuing to have this conversation. And when you think about how trauma circulates for people or how they process it, um, particularly with the work of Judith Butler, who is the uh, godmother of, uh, of, of trauma and theory, um, People who have been affected by it tend to process it, process it over and over and over again. And so I think when you look at this, these paintings as a response to trauma, it's much easier to see the similarities and the links that they share. Um, and also what is particularly interesting is Basquiat did not name a lot of his paintings, which is why there are a lot of untitled. Um, defacement was actually named by Keith Haring. Um, but back of the neck, um, and speaking with the man who helped him make, who helped him helped him to create the this the print, um, Basquiat named this painting, named this print, and I think that that's also an important, a very important detail. Um, this is Keith Haring's work, Michael Stewart, USA for Africa. He did this in 1985, and again, trauma and Keith Haring. Uh, this was a case that really affected Keith Haring. Um, he was very active in the organizing and donated to the legal fund um, for Michael Stewart's uh, uh, defense. And so, um, and so again, you see 1985, this is almost two years after Michael Stewart's death, and it's still being processed. Um, and I also think it's important um, to say that defacement in the process of talking to Basquiat friends, ex-girlfriends over the last 13 years. Um, defacement is a painting that, that comes up when you ask the question of what is a painting that meant a lot to him. And I think it's particularly interesting that Kelly Inman, which, who was his last girlfriend and has since um, died, um, she mentioned defacement as being very important to Jean-Michel and him talking about it. And you know they dated in 1987 to 1988, and that's four years after Michael Stewart. So again, kind of this just being a very, very important case that impacted not just Jean Michel but Keith Haring and that artist community um, for a, for most of the dec for most of the 80s. Um, this is what the reading room looked like when we had this painting in exhibition, and you can see the frame here of um, 
of that I was talking about earlier that Keith Haring chose and had modeled after the Ritz Carlton in Paris. Um, and thinking of it in that way, it has a very kind of macabre um, humor, uh, which kind of matches um, what I've read and have heard about Keith Haring. Um, but it was, um, and that was a big decision to kind of just have that one painting. We went over many scenarios, like would this be paired with other paintings from, or f photographs from the permanent collection? What would it look like? Um, again, it's not, un it's not unheard of to have one exhibition, one painting as an exhibition, but it is rare. And I think that ultimately it was more powerful and very powerful to have that one painting and you could feel the energy of it um, as soon as you walked into the room. Um, and it more than carried and held its own. And uh, speaking with the curatorial assistant for the AGO show in Toronto, um, which was um, where I saw it, uh, she said that it was very tough to decide if it would be with other Basquiat paintings. And I believe they built a wall just for this painting in the exhibition because it is so powerful and very difficult to pair it with other paintings. Um, and in terms of what Williams's uh, place in the Basquiat conversation is, is um, it, it's a tremendous opportunity. Um, Basquiat is a very popular painter who somehow scholastically, um, the, the research has not quite matched the popularity. And so um, I do think that that will change. And I do think, and I've always maintained, that Basquiat is and will continue to be one of the most important painters that America has ever produced. And I think that it there's a tremendous opportunity for Williams to um, be the intellectual home for that research and to lead some of that research. Um, there's obviously the amazing history that the art history department has. Um, and also by incorporating artists like Jean-Michel Basquiat, like Keith Haring, um, the, the program remains competitive. You know, there is a whole generation of art writers, art curators, art directors um, who want to be Basquiat scholars, who want to be Keith Haring scholars, who want to study Francesco Clemente. And um, you have to give them the tools to do that. And you have to create spaces where they can do that work. And I think that because the field is so open uh, right now, there are only maybe five or six people actually doing uh, Basquiat work. And in terms of actual research, that number is about two or three. Um, so it's a very, very small field. And there's a tremendous opportunity for Williams to contribute to that and um, work in tandem with WICMA. Um, because again, it cannot be overstated how deeply uh, WICMA saw the potential and saw how important this painting was. Um, and I think we've already kind of set the precedence, um, even with the winter study class being taught on Basquiat, to my knowledge, um, it is the only, uh, it's the first Basquiat course that I have seen. Um, I would love to be wrong about that. Um, I know that they do, they're beginning to teach him in courses, but in terms of there actually just being an exclusive class on him, that is, we're still a bit away from that. But I think that if there is a commitment to, to the vision and the resources, I think it could be done. And I think that it would um, be incredibly advantageous and powerful for the Williams Art History Department to do that. Um, another question I get sometimes is, what's next? Um, expanding the project in three key areas. The website, research, and collaborating with museums. And what I mean by the website, um, we do have a website, and I will give you the link to that or up here later. Um, but it's important that the Basquiat research be accessible and not just to people with art history degrees. I have found that art is one of the things that no matter how smart people are, they almost immediately preface it by saying, I don't know that much about art. Um, and I think that that is 
incongruous with the mission of what art in, uh, is supposed to do, which is be accessible to everyone and really speak to the human experience. So by expanding the website, um, you know, having original scholarship there, um, collaborating with other Basquiat scholars and Picasso scholars, um, it's, it, it's a place where people who would not be able to go to some of the museum shows um, can still access this research um, and not feel intimidated by that. Um, the research, again, one of the challenges of doing work in real time is that it changes very quickly. So for example, I um, had an academic paper that I was all ready to publish, but then we found um, a poster from that period that completely upended what we thought about defacement. It's compositionally very, very similar. Um, and you can't honestly talk about defacement or the creation of defacement without talking about this poster, which you would have absolutely have seen. So some of the challenges of doing work like this is that it changes. And also, there just has not been research on defacement. So, you know, so for me, there's the dual challenge of of communicating with the public and having it there, collaborating with museums, but also doing it, which just changes very quickly. Um, and then the collaboration with museums, um, I cannot speak publicly the names, but um, the art world and um, curators have been watching very intently with what we've been doing here with this project and what it means, um, and really giving Basquiat more than the huge, massive retrospective, but really doing a show that is based on an, in, uh, an intent focus. Um, and so the hope and the goal is that with collaborating with key museums, bringing defacement and other related works to the public in exhibition in a very small and controlled way that um, kind of moves beyond the hype and the popularity and really delves into the history um, and really positions this painting as his most important. Um, and then fundraising, um, people ask all the time, how much money does it take to do this? Um, it takes a lot. Um, and in terms of, so I've blocked out the next two to three years to work on this um, in addition to another project and really making sure that this project stays independent um, because I think that it's a much stronger position to collaborate with museums and collaborate with people rather than being in-house where you have other political and artistic visions and responsibilities that don't lend itself to being as intellectually flexible as research like this needs to be. Um, and also just the idea of focusing exclusively on one painting for two or three years, that's a very, very expensive thing that most museums do not have the manpower or the budget to do. Um, and ensuring that the scholarship and discourse can continue without me on a daily basis. Um, I literally wake up and think about this painting every single day. Um, and it is a lot of work. And, um, but it is a privilege to do this work. And I think for me, one of the achievements will be th when this research and this painting is properly in the canon and properly in the discourse and does not need me to shepherd it as much. Um, and so that's a tremendous responsibility. But for me, um, the, I will be doing this research throughout my career, particularly with Basquiat. But um, the goal is to, after two to three years, um, kind of archive work with the museum um, or a library to archive it digitally um, and perhaps release some of those papers to other scholars who want to uh, look at defacement and what it says about the rest of Basquiat's work and you know, maybe uh, not quite give the reins over, but um, really uh, open, up, open it up for what the next generation of scholars think about this painting. And you guys can take a screenshot of this, but these are resources and kind of if you want to learn more about the project and there's a website and there's an email sign up for updates. Um, also on the website is the talk that we did in November with Dr. Jordana Segezi and Franklin Sermons, which was titled Basquiat's Defacement, Ambivalence, Identity, and Black Lives Matter. Um, the Google search Basquiat Defacement yields a lot of 
a lot of results. Um, I'm also on Instagram and Twitter, and I post a lot about Basquiat, so. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you.